Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jared, for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, where are you based out of, Michael? Based out of Vernon, BC. Oh, uh, we just had Cal Tyre on a little while ago. They're they're out of this. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, they're my neighbors. Um, it's been a while since I've been out to that very beautiful part of the world. Uh, it's not quite as fun to travel there. Um, where do you are, are you serving clients all across Canada, or where is sort of your reach? Yeah, no, I serve clients all, all across uh, Canada and the United States. Was it a big pivot for you uh, being, uh, were you already doing a lot of remote type work or has this sort of, uh, has, have you had to adapt quite a bit? Um, I was doing a little bit of remote work, but uh, no, I've, I've adapted to, to fully virtual and actually found that there's actually been a lot of advantages going to, to fully virtual, uh, not just for me, but also at, uh, when I provide training and uh, for, for clients that actually works out uh, quite well. Yeah, I mean, you certainly pack more into a day when you're not having to to get on a plane and fly over to the U.S. and things like that. Yeah, for sure. It's been great. What is uh, Avail Leadership? Um, are you the founder and, and what's sort of the what is the core value or, or goal of the organization? Yeah, so Avail Leadership, I founded Avail Leadership six years ago. Um, I had a background in HR, but uh, founded Avail Leadership because I really wanted to help organizations create a culture that produces better leaders. I saw uh, when I was working in industry, I saw a great need uh, for for better leadership um, in uh, in the organizations that I was with, and so that's really where where uh, the idea came from. But really, my mission is to kind of demystify leadership. I think a lot of people think of leadership as like this art and this. I don't know. Some people have it, some people don't. That's actually not true at all. And leadership comes down to just. Uh, just doing the right things. And, and so I try to make it easy for people in leadership positions to become kind of those awesome leaders that the, the type of leaders that, that they wish they had. Um, and uh, by, by kind of uh, identifying what are those high impact behaviors that really make the biggest difference and uh, help, help them influence others in a more positive and up, uplifting way. I was, I, we're going to get into the accountability side of it. And, um, but I was reading an article of yours and you, I think the words were a standard of leadership. Um, artic- there's a sort of a failure to articulate a standard of leadership. I think it was titled, very good title, Stop Bad Bosses. Um, and can you just talk a little bit about that article? Yeah, actually, the uh, the article really came out of the work that I've been doing. When I first started uh, Avail Leadership, I really was really focused on succession planning, helping organizations, you know, create that that process for continue helping people to continually develop themselves and prepare themselves to take on greater responsibility within the organizations. And so, one of the first things that I did with organizations is I helped them come up with a standard of leadership, like what does good leadership look like in your organization? Because the problem is, is we promote people into into leadership positions. Uh, but you know, one hiring manager has has one idea in his mind about what good leadership looks like and what he's looking for. Another leader has a good idea, you know, in in her mind about what good leadership looks like, and so she'll promote different types of people um, depending on the standard that she has in her mind. And the problem, and that's one of the key key problems that we have is is a there's a whole bunch of different perspectives about what good leadership looks like, and b nobody has shared those perspectives, and so they're all on different, you know, nobody's on the same page. And so what that means is that not only do organizations not know really what they're looking for, they haven't told the people that they're looking to promote what they're looking for. And so they don't know what to develop. And so that's a real problem. And that's one of the key reasons why we keep getting bad leaders. Um, And uh, so what I do with organizations is I work with focus groups and help them to come up with um, this, this standard of good leadership. And we're not looking, we're not trying to create this laundry list of all of the behaviors of good leadership, because that would be kind of an infinity long list. What we're looking for is the highest impact leadership behaviors. Not all leadership behaviors have the same impact on people and results. And so we're looking for the the few uh, leadership behaviors that have the highest positive impact on people and results. And so once we figure that out, we just say to my clients, say to their, to their employees, look, you know, we don't, we're not expecting you to be perfect, 
but you know, bring all of the talents that you have, all of the strengths that you have, bring them to the table, but just do these three or four things. If you can just learn to do these three or four habits and develop these three or four competencies, you will be an amazing leader for us. So that's, um, that's what I do. And, and, uh, and that's how I help organizations um, come up with that standard of leadership. And does it change per, um, I mean, does it, a two part question, does it change uh, per organization, depending on what they're doing and what they're offering, their setup, how large they are, um, and to pivot into the accountability side of it, is accountability ever not part of that? Yeah, so it does. Um, every organization has a slightly different standard, right? You're the you know the highest impact behaviors in a high tech company uh, are going to be different than the highest impact leadership behaviors in, for example, uh, you know a mining organization. And so there is there are some differences, um, but there's a lot of overlap. And actually, to your point. That's actually what helped me that what really kind of uh, kind of made that transition uh, and focus in my in my practice. Uh, I, I still work on succession planning, but I'm now really, really focused on accountability because I noticed that every single time what I would do is I'd work with focus groups within the organization, management, non-management focus groups, and just really ask them to reverse engineer their success stories so that we could figure out what were the behaviors that really led to successful outcomes. And I tell you what, I, as, as far as I can remember, we're at 100%, 100% of the time when we did this. Um, and I've done this with dozens and dozens and dozens of, of focus groups, possibly hundreds of focus groups. Um, accountability is always one of the highest impact leadership behaviors that that uh, leads to successful outcomes. And so I became really, really fascinated with this principle of accountability and why it's so critical um, to, to becoming an awesome leader. When I, um, to preface this question, um, I was, I've watched a lot of videos of, of people like, well, not people like, specifically of uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson. And he one thing he taught me for sure is the the a simple question that we just kind of it, it's almost like why even ask it but then when you actually dig into that question there just is a whole world that opens up for you it's it's and so that leads me to say what is accountability because it's a word that gets thrown around <laughs> like you wouldn't believe i pretty much hear it in any time i talk about leadership and accountability and you, you just hear it it just gets kind of thrown in there and everybody kind of agrees and goes yeah we need to be accountable so i'm just going to ask the question what is accountability yeah, so it's kind of an interesting question because when I, I speak to, um, to CEO groups across the country and when I speak about accountability and ask them, you know, about their feelings about accountability, everybody has, everybody has positive feelings about it. And it's great. We need more of it. Um, but it's interesting when I talk to people who are perhaps kind of lower down on the totem pole uh, and maybe non-management positions, uh, I get, a, I get mi mixed reactions and some people are afraid of it. Some people are like, oh crap, not this, not this accountability discussion again. And it's because people have been beaten over the head with accountability, um, I think, by their leaders, um, as well as I think people have learned to fear accountability because of the way it's used kind of in pop pop culture and in the media. Uh, for example, when when you read sometimes in the headlines, you'll see, uh, you know, this politician needs to be held accountable. What you're really reading, what you're really hearing when you read that sentence is this politician is to blame and they must be punished. Right. And so that's really kind of the, the, the problem that we have created when we have used and misused this term accountability is we're actually uh, uh, unintentionally teaching people to avoid and fear the very thing that's going to make them and the organization successful. So the first thing is, is I like to clarify what accountability is not. It is not blame and punishment. OK, that's not what it is. Um, another thing that kind of gets confused with with accountability is the word responsibility and uh, responsibility and accountability. They're linked, but they are very different things. And it's important to get clear on what the difference is between responsibility and accountability. So responsibility is taking ownership of activities, right, or tasks. Um, or, and, and so if you're doing everything on your job description, 
you're a responsible person. If you are a parent and you provide your, your children with a, a house and clothing and food and love and safety, you you are a responsible parent. So that's great. We want to be responsible. We want responsible employees. But accountability is a little bit different. Accountability is taking ownership of results. Mm. And we're not as concerned about doing everything on our, on our checklist. We're concerned about getting the right results. And the difference between accountability and responsibility really was made clear to me one time when I was working in industry, there was this, uh, there's a payroll uh, administrator and she was quite possibly the most uh, responsible person in the company, right? She made sure to do everything to the letter of the law. And, uh, and in fact, when you'd ask her to do something, she'd say, Hey, can you put that in an email for me so that I can just make sure to do it perfectly? And that's great. Uh, but I'll tell you what, and uh, her name was Diane and, and uh, any, any time though, we didn't get the results that we were looking to get, right? Anytime that, you know, things went sideways, Diane was the first to say, ah, 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 I only did what you told me to do. Look, it's right here. And I just did what you told me to do. Right. She was responsible, but she wanted nothing to do with accountability. And the problem is, is in organizations, I think we're unintentionally training people to be so responsible that we're siloing them and, you know, in their own domain, and they, and they were putting blinders on people and say, look, we didn't actually hire you just to do your job. We hired you to get certain results and to help the organization win. And so that's really what accountability is about is saying, hey, look, you, you could do everything on your job description and still not get the right results. That's not what we want. We want you to focus on the results. Um, and uh, and that, will, that will mean that, hey, we're going to, uh, even if, even if uh, maybe you know, I'm, I'm supposed to do something that's going to help my department, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be more focused on helping the organization hope, uh, and helping the team win. Is that a, that, that approach, is that, is that something that's, how do I say it? Um, is that a culture that's brought in by the leadership or is that, is that an individual thing that people bring with them because of sort of how um, just sort of how they re receive or how they confuse accountability with responsibility? Um, does it, where does it start? Do you think? I, I think that you'll probably find that attitude a little bit more ingrained in union environments um, where people are, you know, conditioned to be like, nope, just focus on the job description and that's all you got to do. And so that might be a challenge for, uh, for organizations in, in union environments, but there is, there is hope there is, and, and there are things you can do to, to, uh, to make it more likely that people will take accountability and focus on accountability. Um, but, uh, but I think that I think I think it's both actually, Jared. I think that it's people. Some people are born um, to be more and, and raised in such a way that they they turn out to be more accountable people than others. But I also believe that there are many things that leaders do um, unconsciously that make it harder for people to step up and take accountability and make it harder for people to focus on the results instead of focusing on their tasks. It's, it's really a tricky thing. And, and honestly, for even for me coming into this um, interview, that, that word accountability were, uh, versus responsibility, the way you've laid it out, it's very obvious. But I, I would probably put those two words together. Um, I won't now after this interview. But do you, when you go in, I mean, is it a lot of, and I guess maybe this is a better way of asking it. Is a big part of your job when you're going in to just help people separate those two things? Because you can say it in theory, but actually making it part of the culture to separate those two things, that, that seems to be the real challenge. Yeah, and I think one of the best ways really to address that is to, the problem is, is I think a lot of people have different definitions of what accountability is. And what I do with organizations is I help them to just say, look, here's a very, very simple definition of what accountability is. And if you can just, if you can just, um, you know, share this with the organization and refer to it often, it will start to help people shift their mindset. And the definition of accountability that I share with organizations is that accountability is taking ownership of results and working to improve future results. Mm. 
So there's really kind of two parts to, to accountability. It's a, it's a very simple definition, but there's a lot in that. And taking ownership of results, you know, it's, we're talking about um, taking the initiative, you know, having pride in your work, um, you know, caring more about the outcomes than, than the tasks. That's taking ownership of, your, of the results as we talked about. But working to improve future results is, a, is an essential other part of accountability. Accountability is not just concerned about getting the right results now or, or for this quarter. Accountability is saying, look, it's, a, it's about sustain, sustainability and, and, and having sustainable uh, uh, positive outcomes. And so you want to be doing things like, um, like you know, learning from your mistakes um, and, and sharing you know, some of the things that went wrong so that we can all learn from them so that we can be better in the future, so that we can provide um, you know, better service in, in the future. Um, and so that's, that's the other, other component of accountability. And it sometimes means planning, doing the things that we don't want to do. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem like we're going to get instant results, but doing those other things, um, uh, such as planning, such as learning from our mistakes, um, taking care of the quality of the stuff that we hand off to our, to our teammates. So they don't, they don't have to deal with our, our mistakes. Um, that's about long-term sustainable thinking. And that's the, that's the second part of that definition of accountability. I think you, you touched on something very interesting about just, um, leaders reminding and putting just sort of bringing it up because I think there is a temptation, you know, you might hear someone like yourself, they come on the show, you come on the show, you have a lot of good things to say. And then it's very tempting to kind of burst through the door the next day and try to change everything rather than start to, I mean, cultures develop. I mean, society cultures develop over a long period of time. And in business, you can't just snap your fingers and then everybody's going to switch the culture. It really does take a consistent and, and long-term approach, right? For sure. Yeah. No, and, and it's and it takes it takes people in leadership positions who are willing to constantly refer back to that definition and say and say things like that was and you know, point out positive examples like that was an awesome example of taking ownership of results or way, way to, um, you know, work to improve future results. And, you know, as leaders refer back to this definition, people will begin to say, Hey, accountability is kind of a good thing. And I want to be accountable because I get praised for it. Um, and, but it's important for, for those in leadership positions to really define that by referring to that definition often. You've worked with organizations. So you, you've seen both sides of it and, so when you look at what do you see consistently when you see low accountability versus a company that you see high accountability and let's it's, if we can let's go for both the positive and the negative. Yeah, for sure. You know, one time I was um, I was working with this client organization and uh, awesome awesome company they had um, they they they're what I consider a purpose driven and people first organization. They have it figured out. Um, and, uh, like people that I would talk to, uh, they could recite their mission on the spot. Anybody could, and they could even share with me examples of how people in the organization were fulfilling the mission. So great organization. But one time uh, I was in a meeting with the senior management team and the CEO asked a question that really struck me. He said, so how often are you guys? And I said, guys, because this was a, this what happened to be a management team or an executive team of all men. But he said, how many of you? Are um, or how often do you hit the results that you want to hit? How often do you, are you achieving the goals that you want to achieve? And there was a bit of a pause. And then one guy kind of is like, you know what? Eh, we're probably about 50, 50. We're about, you know, we're hitting our goals about 50% of the time. And the rest of the guy, people around the table nodded their heads in commiseration. Yeah. Like, yeah. We're probably about 50, 50. And as a consultant sitting here, my job about hit the floor. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is an amazing organization. How can you only be hitting your goals, you know, half the time and you're missing your goals half the time. But that's something that I find is that organizations, um, you know, it's great to have high engagement. That's essential. Um, it's a, it's great that every, you know, if everybody knows what their job is, but one of the key problems with organizations and a key yellow flag is that if organizations are not meeting their goals, if they're missing deadlines, if, if they're not, uh, if, if employees are not getting along, if there's uh, unproductive uh, conflict between teams, uh, if managers are not uh, addressing poor performance, there's finger pointing, um, us versus them, you know, people who are making excuses, these are all 
uh, I would say yellow to red flags that you have an accountabil accountability problem. Um, so, and my point in sharing that story is that, look, nobody's immune. You can have, you know, an amazing organization that has really high employee engagement and, uh, and still I find that many of these organizations, most of these organizations, um, have some work to do on accountability, but on the flip side, um, you know, the, the signs of high accountability, the things that we want, the behaviors that we want are really people who are, um, teammates who are going out of their way to help out other teammates, right? It's not within their job description. They don't have to do that. But when they go out of the way to help other teammates, that, those are accountable people. It's people who are you know, suggesting solutions to managers instead of uh, coming to managers with only problems, right? Um, it's uh, managers who are addressing poor performance in a positive and an uplifting way. Um, another key thing that you'll find in organizations that have high accountability is people are not afraid of making mistakes. And in fact, when they do mis make mistakes, they say, hey, I want everybody to see what, you know, we, myself or our department, we just made a mistake here. And I want everybody to know about it so that you don't make that same mistake. That is a, and that happens in very, very few organizations because most organizations, you want to hide your mistakes because uh, management has made it crystal clear that mistakes are career limiting. Let me tell you, if you want accountability, that is the last thing you want. You do not want people to fear mistakes. You want people to learn from their mistakes and they're never going to learn from their mistakes. Uh, if you, if you make it uh, mistakes taboo. Uh, so those are, those are, um, you know, positive outcomes, obviously things such as trust and cooperation naturally emerge, um, when you, when you have an environment of, of accountability. We, uh, my wife and I watched a show, what's it called? Oh, that's the show's called cloud. No, the store is called cloud nine. Now it's slipping me what the show's called. Um, super, super store or something like that. And we were watching it and we were just talking again. How do you inspire, <laughs> how do you inspire like some of these jobs? And, and they all, and I love the show because they always show clips of customers doing things like, you know, pulling a shirt from the middle and then they all topple over. <laughs> you were just watching going, how do you like, you know, how do you inspire people? And then you've got some of that. Um, you sent through a presentation I got to look through and on the heels of me watching that show. And of course, I mean, in this environment where we're not seeing each other in person, you know, site, site visits are harder, all these types of things, especially in this heavy industry, mining and things like that. Where do you start to inspire a team at sort of any type of company? You know, it's a great question because what I do when I share, uh, when I share my presentation with CEO groups, I actually do a little bit of an experiment with them and, and, and I trick them a little bit. Um, because first of all, I tell them, and this is true, uh, there are really three different ways that you can influence accountability within your organization. Um, and it's a, through your own personal example of demonstrating personal accountability, B by how you hold other people accountable in a positive way. And C, there are certain conditions that you can put in place that make it easier for everybody within the organization to, to step up and take accountability. And so what I do is I ask CEOs um, when I do in this presentation with them, I say, hey, you know, we don't have time to talk about all three of these domains. Um, if you had the option of which to choose, which, which would you choose to learn about? Do you want to learn about um, how to better demonstrate personal accountability, how to hold other people accountable in a positive way, or how to, um, you know, put in place those conditions of accountability? And always, again, this is 100% of the time, um, they, and we use this live polling app, and, and I can go through, I have the data, 100% of the time, it's either... Um, how do we put in place the conditions of accountability or how do we hold other people accountable in a positive way? It is never, you know what? I'd like to learn how I can demonstrate personal accountability better. Never. But the reason why I do this is to illustrate a point. You cannot create a culture of accountability until you as the leader are setting the highest standard possible of personal accountability. Nobody's going to listen to your message about accountability unless they see you demonstrating it. Now, most CEOs are saying, you know, are thinking like, well, hey, I, I, I am the model of accountability. 
But what I've discovered is that there are many things. There are there are um, there are, actually there are a handful of things that CEOs can do, and, and anybody in leadership positions can do um, to to uh, make it easier for everybody to take accountability. The most important thing that they can do is to set that standard of accountability themselves. Nobody is going to demonstrate accountability to a higher standard than the leader. So leaders need to make darn sure that they are setting the highest possible standard. Um, and we're all naturally wired to say when there's an accountability problem, we're all naturally wired to say, yeah, Michael, I need you to come in and fix my employees because they are not being accountable. The problem is out here, right? Um, and there's a great quote that Stephen Covey said that I love. He says, anytime that you think that the problem is out there, that very thought is the problem. Accountability starts with the people in leadership positions. Um, and so that's where that's really where you start. Um, and so I'll work with organizations, first of all, to help um, the, the people in leadership positions know what are those those high impact behaviors that they can do to really set that uh, that standard of accountability before we talk about the other ways to demonstrate or the other ways to to create that culture of, of, of accountability. Does it get more challenging to when, when you start have that discussion, especially if you're working in an organization, there's one CEO, there's a handful of C-level executives. Um, it, is it easier to go into a management team or when you get into that C-level, does it get become even harder to sort of, um, I guess, need that out, get, get that get them to, to look at some of those accountability and, and the way that they're approaching things and, and make the adjustments. Does it get harder in the higher levels or does it, is it actually getting easier? Are they more self-aware and, and, and easier, more able to adapt? That's kind of an interesting word you used. Are they more self-aware or less self-aware? And actually the research has shown, brace yourself, but the research has shown that self-awareness tends to increase until you get about to the management level. But after the frontline manager, self-awareness decreases every next step of the, you know, the higher up you go in the, in the hierarchy, the less self-awareness you tend to have until the CEOs typically have the least self-awareness in the entire organization. And the reason is, is because they get the least amount of feedback. Uh, nobody's telling the CEO what they need to do better. Um, and so, and so that's a very interesting observation that you had, but I'll tell you what, the way that I get around that is that I make it clear that if anybody wants to engage me, then if anybody wants to, to learn about these, uh, these principles that I teach, um, there is a rule and the rule is um, executives have to be at all of the training because I've done that in the past where executives will bring me in and it's like, oh, we just want to train the middle managers. We want to train the supervisors because the problem is with them. Uh, but what happens inevitably is the people say, hey, Michael, this was great. But you know what? The people who really need this are not here. And what's going to happen is the people in leadership positions unintentionally um, do and say things that counteract the message that I've just given to their middle, middle managers. And so I don't do that anymore. And it's part of the agreement that I, uh, that I have when I work with clients is I say, Anything that we we are going to start at the top, my preference actually would be not to teach their employees at all. No. My preference would be I'm going to teach the executive team, the senior management team. I'm going to teach you these principles. And I'd like you to teach the rest of your organization through your example. Yeah. First. And then uh, and use words if necessary. But that's what I would prefer. Yeah. It's and, and I, I just I'm going to throw something out there um, that, and I, I just want to see your feedback and I'm sure you've heard some version of this before, um, but this is a genuine thing that I went through in, in, in management positions is there was a point where it was, you know, I, I understood the importance of showing a, a, an example. Um, and, but then I realized there's also this next step, which is number two, it's, it's, it is in there as the top three is part of being accountable as a leader is going back to what you said about putting people in leadership position and having standards laid out is being a, is taking the time to show the interest in holding people accountable and not in a, in a harsh way, but actually engaging with them. Because if you don't, it's like, they don't really matter. It's almost like what they do doesn't really have an effect. And that there's sort of a fine line between a leader 
in a way, and I, th- I think you'll be able to clarify this, focus too much on themselves, working on themselves. And part of that working on themselves when you're a leadership position is being fully engaged in the accountability of your team. Is that yeah, for sure? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, it goes back to, like I said at the beginning, um, you know, when we're, when we're creating the standard of what, what does good leadership look like? And it's about, um, it's about demonstrating personal accountability. It's, it's holding other people accountable in a positive way. It's creating those conditions of accountability. Um, for sure. That's, that is, that is one of the key responsibilities of somebody in a leadership position. And when you talk about, you know, holding other people accountable, really, the 90% of holding other people accountable is doing things to set them up for success. Mm. A lot of times leaders will say, here's what I want you to do. Go away and do it. And if you don't come, if you don't do it properly, I, I'm going to you know, beat you up for it verbally, you know, beat you up for it. That is not demonstrating accountability. And that is not holding people accountable in a positive way. Holding people apo- accountable in a positive way is really about, about setting them up for success, being crystal clear about what you're trying to accomplish, um, giving them the option of how they, you know, some, some choice about how to accomplish it. Um, meeting with them, as you mentioned, on a regular basis, taking the time to sit with them at the end and say, hey, let's, you assess yourself based on this, these, uh, these outcomes that we said that we wanted to achieve or that you wanted to achieve. Um, you know, it's, it's doing those things and it's taking the time to, to, uh, really care about the people who are working for you, you are going to, um, you know, take the time to, to set them up and to, and I know some people will say, Oh, that's handholding. Well, you know what? That's the job of a leader. Yeah. Right. You don't think if you don't think that, you know, holding people's hands and helping them to, to be successful as part of your job, then you are in the wrong job buster. (laughs) So, so anyways, yeah, that's, those are some of the things, um, that, uh, that you can do to help people be accountable. Do you have a way that people could sort of, going back to that self-awareness, um, do you have a way that people could sort of uh, it, go through like some sort of checklist uh, that sort of outlines sort of where someone's at? Yeah, for sure. Um, there is, uh, I actually have um, a personal accountability survey and, and I'll do this when I have a little bit more time with CEO groups, I'll actually walk them through this and have them have them complete the survey just to figure out kind of where they're at before I actually get into, okay, this is where you're at as far as demonstrating personal accountability. accountability. Let me share with you the three highest impact things you can do to set the highest standard of accountability. And that's kind of my lead in to, uh, to sharing, sharing those, um, those three, three key habits. You know, the, I want to, I wonder if we can swing it around a little bit because we focused on that leadership side. Um, but to swing it around because you are working with people. Do you just work with people at at least a management level or do you work with, do you work with a team of engineers um, that, you know, have one manager, there's 10 engineers, and then there's a couple different divisions. Are you dealing with the whole uh, organization or where do you sort of come in? Cause I, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the flip side of a lot of people that watch are their employees. They, they aren't in a management position. Right. Um, it, and you know, they, it's easy to sort of feel like you're being dumped on or so I kind of want to swing it around a bit for on them. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the principles that I that I share about how to demonstrate personal accountability, they ideally we want the leaders to be demonstrating those those principles first, but that's that's not always the case. And uh, and the principles that I teach about how to demonstrate personal accountability for sure apply to everybody. And as you, an amazing thing is, is as you demonstrate personal accountability to a high degree, um, you're going to find that you're not only is it kind of like a secret formula to success, but it's also going to increase other people's respect for you. And, and then your leaders will start to think, or the people in leadership will will start to think that's precisely, they won't know why, but they'll just look at you and be like, you know, you're, you're the type of person that we want in leadership positions. That's the type of, and so you'll see that those people tend to get promoted. That's ideally what we want. Um, And because we need people with more accountability promoted into leadership positions. So, yeah. Absolutely. Everything that I share is, is uh, applicable to, to people at all levels. I think it's, I think it's very, ta- I, well, again, going through your slide, I saw this, it was quite funny. It's, it's, a, it's they're holding, I'm a victim cards. Um, and I think it's really, it's really easy to, I, I've been an employee and I've been a manager. So I, I've been on both sides of it and it's really easy 
to feel like the victim. And, and I just wonder, just because you've had that experience of coaching people and, and training organizations, how do you sort of get out of that feeling? Because once you're there, it, it is difficult to, to, yeah. to, to not to say, okay, I'm not going to be the victim anymore. Um, yeah. Where, where do you, would you sort of start? Well, what I, what I do is I, um, I share with, uh, with people, you know, we all know those types of people who are always complaining about how life is so unfair to them. Right. And we never think that we are that person. Um, but I know this lady, she was, uh, she's probably the most, uh, abrasive person I've ever met in my life. And every time I talk to her, she's always talking about her three ex-husbands who are just deadbeats. Uh, she was talking about her kids who don't respect her talking about her boss who's so mean to her because he expects her to bring a, a doctor's note to support her, her absence and stuff like that. The world is just so mean to me. And this whole time that I'm listening to her, I'm thinking, you know what, lady, you are the cause of most of your problems that you just refuse to see. And the thing is, is we all, I think we all know somebody like that, but we never think of ourselves as that. And I'll tell you what, the problem with blaming and really what a victim is, is a victim that says, look, you know, this lady would say, if my three ex-husbands don't magically become great guys, well, my life is just going to suck for the rest of my life. And there's nothing I can do about it. If, if my children don't magically begin respecting me, then, you know, my life is just going to be terrible. And the problem is, is when you enter into that victim mentality, what you actually do, you literally give away your power to overcome your problems yeah. to the people or circumstances that you blame for your problems, right? If you don't own your problems and say, you know what? I probably have contributed to my problems and which means that I probably have some influence in changing my outcomes. And so that's really where the power comes from in demonstrating personal accountability is, is you actually retain, you, you take uh, power back um, when you when you own your own problems and stop blaming other people and circumstances for your for your problems, and you might say, "Hey, look, you know, maybe most of maybe a lot of my problems are in fact um, you know coming from the outside, but I can almost guarantee you that if you take a look at most of your problems, you will be able to find some way something you could have done to either reduce the likelihood of that problem happening or reduce the impact." Um, of how severe that problem is. And so as long as we can start to take a look at how we are contributing to our own problems, that is how we obtain the power to overcome them. It's quite challenging and it's, it's, it's hard to be, I, I would love to do that assessment that you have one day because it is hard to, to look at yourself. I know I'm, I, for me, I try. Sometimes I'm halfway through a, uh, saying something. And I go, I really wish I wasn't saying this right now, but I guess, <laughs> I guess we're into it now. And I'm sure, I'm sure we all, I'm sure we all feel that. Um, Do you want me to share with you sort of my formula for helping people to even, even people who, you know, don't aren't, aren't like true, true victims. We, I think we all kind of slip into that victim mentality sometimes when we start blaming other people and yeah. circumstances for our problems. But I've discovered that there are three really high impact behaviors, whether you're in a leadership position or not, that will help you set the highest standard of personal accountability. And those three habits are habit number one of personal accountability, of demonstrating personal accountability is don't blame. Blame kills accountability. And I'll explain in just a little bit, if you like, how, how it kind of acts like a virus acts within a body. The second habit is look in the mirror. And looking in the mirror is really acknowledging how I have contributed to my own problems. Okay, that is habit number two. Habit number three is engineer the solution. So focus on fixing processes not people. And when you start to, and I'll, I'll, I can elaborate on all, on all three of those if you'd like, but as you, as you demonstrate those three principles, those three habits, you will set a standard of accountability that not only will make other people want to follow you as a leader, but it will make other people want to emulate you. And they, and people will say, yeah, you know what? I, you know, it'll make people feel more comfortable saying, you know what? That, that was my bad. And here's what I'm going to do to fix it. Here's how I'm going to engineer that solution. 
But if you'd like, I can share with you a little bit more info about, um, about each one of those three habits. Well, the one that I really want to touch on, and if you could, Michael, I actually would like to go backward on this because oh, sure. um, the, the engineer, the solution, I have seen leaders, they don't blame anybody. They talk very gentle. You know, they, you know, they go through those, they, they kind of hit these sort of checklists of sort of stereotypical, um, I guess, I, I guess what they're perceiving as a good leader, but you could be really nice to everybody as your business is sinking. <laughs> so I want to talk, I want to talk about that engineering, the solution, because if you, you, you don't blame that, I a hundred percent agree that that doesn't work, but if you don't engineer a solution, it is just, it's just going to be a pleasant death. That is what's going to happen. <laughs> I like that. Um, I want to talk about how you approach that because I think, a lot of people that are watching this, that is going to be so important for them to hear. Sure. And uh, a lot of times people are, you know, they're surprised to hear that, that term when I'm, when I'm teaching somebody how to be a, a better leader. Um, and, uh, you know, we're talking about quote unquote soft skills. A lot of people are surprised to hear that, that the third habit is to engineer the solution. That sounds like a very hard skill. And, and it really is. And where that comes from is, um, there are really two, only two ways of explaining people-related problems. The first way is called the person approach. And the person approach really states that people are the cause of most problems, right? Once you get human beings involved, that's the problem. Right. And, and the solution then is just, if we just rub people's noses in their mistakes sufficiently, uh, then they'll learn from them. Right. That's the thinking. And that's how we solve uh, problems if we're stuck in that person person approach mindset. But there is another approach. And the other approach is called the systems approach. And I'm sure many of your viewers have heard of systems thinking. And the systems approach says that um, people related problems are the result of bad systems. People make more mistakes when their environment does not support them making the right choice. And so what engineer the solution is really all about is adopting more of a systems approach mindset to problems. And one of the greatest things that you can do, um, because a lot of people will say, well, how do you, how do you stop blaming? How do you stop blaming people when that's kind of your knee jerk reaction? Right. And we are in fact, biologically and psychologically wired to default to that person approach. Oh, there's a problem. Who's the idiot closest to the mess. Let's blame them. Right. Um, but the way we get away from that is to adopt a systems approach mindset. And there's a, I, I call this the systems, uh, the systems approach uh, mantra. And it is this weak leaders ask who is to blame strong leaders ask, where did the system break down? That is your secret weapon. And I encourage you to memorize that mantra. Uh, weak leaders ask who's to blame strong leaders ask, where did the system break down? Because when you, uh, when you ask that question, what it does is it engages the frontal cortex. The problem with blame is that people immediately get defensive and they want to defend and they want to argue with you when you're going to blame with them or when you're going to blame them for, for problems. But when you ask the question, hey, where did the system break down? Immediately, you, you, instead of engaging people's amygdala, uh, which is the fight or flight area of the brain, what you're doing is you're engaging the frontal cortex. And when you engage the frontal cortex, people want to solve the problem. And then they start to look about, okay, well, what are all the possible causes to this problem? And then they will be far more willing to look at their own behavior if they're not being blamed for it. Um, but, uh, but that, that is really the, the, um, engineer, the solution approach is to look at the, look at the external environment. Actually, I can, I'll give you an example, um, really, and it's kind of where the systems approach came from. Um, the systems approach emerged, um, right around the end of world war two and the U S uh, air force discovered that they had a lot of planes crashing unnecessarily. There's a lot of unforced errors. And so naturally they just assumed that they were, they had some 
idiot pilots, right? These dumb pilots who are crashing the planes. There's no mechanical error. It's got to be human error, right? And so they brought in these consultants to really help them hire less error-prone pilots. So these consultants came in and they took a look at the planes and they did their analysis. They did their, their investigation. And what they discovered is it's not the pilots. They took a look at the, uh, the cockpits and they discovered that it is poorly designed cockpits. And so, for example, they had kind of the flap and the landing gear gauges or, or levers were right beside each other. They looked the same. They felt the same. And so it was real easy for somebody to grab the landing gear when they thought they were grabbing the flap. Well, that's a big problem, right? Or they discovered that the uh, propeller and the throttle uh, levers were located in different positions depending on the plane that you were flying. And so people got confused. Now, oh, wait a minute. Where's the right lever? And so these guys discovered that um, when they redesigned the, the uh, cockpits, um, unforced errors uh, almost vanished, right? It, it, it reduced dramatically. And, and the systems approach is really credited uh, with saving countless lives and millions of dollars um, in World War II and at the end of the, and, uh, the, the Korean War. And so what these guys discovered is that it is way easier to change the environment, to change the physical layout, to change the processes. It's way easier to change those things than try to train out human fallibility out of human beings. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the idea behind engineering the solution. Look at ways to change the process and, and your physical layout of your environment to make it easier. This is also the same principles that you'll discover in, in lean manufacturing. Yeah, the, in like Six Sigma and things like Six that. Sigma, exactly. Yeah, we're actually doing a feature on Six Sigma and within the next couple months. So, and I was thinking while you were saying that, um, I was thinking it'd be neat to get from your approach and then a Six Sigma approach on like a panel or something some point. It'd be a very interesting, especially on that manufacturing heavy equipment side. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, but the key is, is that you can use these, and a lot of people don't think about this, but you can use those same principles with when you're dealing with people, not yeah. just when you're de dealing with machinery and supplies. Yeah, it's, it, well, uh, we, we had a bit of a, a slogan that Rory coined here. I actually, no, it came from somewhere else. I just can't remember where, but, but he was using it a lot and it's, uh, he, variation is evil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And all I was thinking when you said about the, those planes, I was thinking I would hate to be the uh, leader uh, in that was once you know the problem and those planes go back up the next day, knowing now why they're crashing. And yeah. you still, especially during war times, you still have to engage. Um, but that's where my mind goes with things sometimes. Yeah. Um, for sure. But it does. It, when you, you know, as we sort of wrap up, um, when you're a leader, you are, you are putting people, people spend more time with the people they work with than sometimes they do with their families. They spend, they, they're, they're giving even, even a bad worker. I, I drive by work sites and that, and I see even a bad worker is still out there in the rain and the cold and they've went to school and they have debt from learning how to do a certain trade or, or whatever they've done. You, they have a lot riding on being successful. So it really is your goal. It's, it's not near the level of putting fighter pilots into the air, but right. you have a huge responsibility to actually take these times. And, and do you think when you're talking with leaders, do you think they're aware of the impact that they being, there's one thing being self-aware, are they aware of the impact that they have on the people that work for them? No, and, and uh, that's a good, good point. And, and I'll tell you what, most organizations do not, understand the impact of leadership within their organizations. If they did understand the impact of leadership, they would actually have some sort of a standard, a criteria, a realistic criteria that they would measure and promote people based on. Um, so organizations, I think, don't. But I think that managers don't as well. From a personal level, you don't realize how your comments and how your behavior impacts other people. Um, and, and the way that you approach things. And I think that um, actually it was the guy, and I shoot, I can't remember his name, but he's the guy that really brought lean from Japan to the, to, uh, to the North America. Um, and uh, he, he learned from Toyota and brought these principles back. Uh, shooting his name escapes me, but he said that 90% 
of workplace problems can be traced back to management, not the people that are the closest to the, to the problem. It tends to be the managers who have set up these conditions, these bad processes, and um, you know that, that have kind of are, are really the root of the problem. And yet it tends to be the people that are closest to the mess tend to get blamed uh, for those problems. Yeah. And so when people are getting blamed, what's going to be their natural reaction? They don't want to take accountability. Yeah, they don't grow at all. Right. <laughs> they just won't do it next. They'll just follow like that lady that you said, the, they'll just follow the email. Look, I did it exactly right. No, that's fine. Anymore. Yeah, I'm only going to do what you tell me to do and nothing more. Nothing and more. that's and that is why, uh, you know, don't blame is habit number one. It does kill accountability dead. As soon as you start blaming people, nobody will want to take accountability if they think it's going to be a career limiting move. Yeah, it's Michael, I, I went into this interview. With the, I always a couple of days before I really start brewing over what what the show is going to be and how the conversation is going. To, and I and I kept looking. I was looking through your slides and I was going, OK, well. I don't really know how to approach this topic. So I hope he's ready <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes I just don't know how I'm going to meander through everything. Um, so thank you for joining us. It, it was, there was so, there was so much. It was, uh, we always pull clips from it. We could probably pull three or four from this, uh, from this interview, um, especially some of the stuff we talked about at the end. I'm going to pull that out so that people can see that, uh, that engineering, the solutions part, um, you know, and how it relates to things like Six Sigma, which a lot of our viewers would be familiar with. So important. I, um, we're going to put links and tag you on LinkedIn. And then I, I hope people reach out to you because at the end of the day, um, they are just, these are just businesses and money and the economy, which are very important things, but they all involve people and, and us as leaders. Um, and hopefully myself, I get into this category. We, we need to realize how much impact we are having on the people that work for us. Right. For sure. Great. Thanks very much, Jared, for having me. Really appreciate it. And uh, glad to be part of the uh, CIM uh, conference and uh, appreciate, appreciate being here. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Okay, Gowdy. Um, I will stop blaming you for everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is hard to believe. And you need to stop blaming me. <laughs> it's, it's just a blame game over here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, that was a that was a fun interview. Um, it was. Uh, Gowdy, where can people follow? I know you're going to put lots of links for yes. Michael and everything, but where can people follow and uh, follow us? Comment. Uh, um, and, and suggest more guests. These mm -hmm. next three guests coming on, um, are all suggested. These are all CIM has worked with us to bring these guests on. Um, and they are picking some just perfect guests and it's different from who we sometimes get on yeah. because they're obviously approaching it different than we are. So Absolutely. it's very cool. Where can people go to do all that? All right. Well, definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel um, so you don't miss a single episode. We've got two episodes a week on there um, and many, many more coming. Um, so please don't forget, subscribe um, to our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on LinkedIn um, and Facebook all throughout social media um, and contact us directly info at crownsman.com. Um, if you'd like to suggest a guest, want to be a guest, or if you'd like to sponsor. Um, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Make sure to check out um, Avail Leadership, um, their website. We'll have plenty of links. Please keep following and subscribe, comment, suggest guests. It is how we make the show happen. And thank you to all our sponsors. It is a huge help that allows us to keep on making this content. And um, hopefully you're getting the value back with all the people that are watching. Thank you. And see you on the next episode of Mining Now.